And I remember Kathy Whitley, my friend, she just kind of looked at me one day and she goes, hey, you need to figure out if you're going to be cool, if you're going to be successful. <laughs> but then once I achieved a number one, a number one record, no, top 10 hits, I was like, when do we get to do the bait and switch? <laughs> if you open up for somebody and you're in front of 100,000 people, it can be badass, but it's never going to be as great as it could be in front of five people that paid to see you play. On the way over to the label, he goes, the money's gone. We've already booked your flights. You're going home. And I thought I was making my second major label record. Like, I thought this was the next step. And when I walked into the office, it was one of those deals where you walk into a building or you walk into a room and everybody looks at you like you just farted in church. <laughs> Jacking Around Podcast is brought to you by Lone Star Dry Goods, a collection of handcrafted quality goods with a truly unique Americana vibe. Visit the world headquarters in the heart of downtown Abilene, Texas and Willow Park, Texas near Fort Worth and visit LoneStarDryGoods.com for more information. Welcome to a special episode of Jacking Around Late Night, a conversation with your host, singer-songwriter and two-time ACM Award winner, Jack Ingram, featuring producer of the show, yours truly, and Jack's tour manager for well over a decade, Kevin Howard. Here's a one minute preview of today's episode where Jack takes you behind the curtain of his journey in the music business, spanning over the past four decades, including stories of writing and recording songs and friendships he's made along the way. Here is episode 20, enjoy. Hey, where did you come up with the name Black Mangrum? Is that what he thought? Are we rolling? Yeah. <laughs> This is I this. telling you, let's been rolling. <laughs> How did I come up with Black Manger? Yeah. Are we really rolling? We yes, are. we are. We're always rolling here. So okay. when I was with, um, when I first got signed up with uh, Lucky Dog and Bruce and Charlie and Blake Chancy, he produced the Dixie Chicks. The first, I think the first, like half of the first record or maybe the whole first record. The, and the he chick, also produced the chicks. the chicks, which, which who? Jack, Charlie, and Bruce were the Dixie dudes, <laughs> the Dixie dicks, <laughs> the Dixie dicks. Because <laughs> you're all on lucky dog, to, and because to they're varying degrees because of the, success, <laughs> because they're brothers and the others are sisters, and and Jack. they cut Bruce's songs and they married Charlie. I had nothing. What to happened? Do with really, what you were just out man out of that that deal. I was just. The younger brother and I was already married. We the little brother. <laughs> You're already married. Yeah, I didn't have a chance. <laughs> we we got they got signed to Lucky Dog because em, because they were friends with Emily and Mari and all that. And mm -hmm. uh, and then they signed me to Lucky Dog, which was a subsidiary of Sony, Columbia. Which, as I found out later, I didn't find out later, but I just assume later, like when when you have a label that's making that kind of money, you have to have another label that drains money. So you're not paying, like you can still make art and you can write it off on your taxes, but you're not paying actual tax money. You're just writing it off this other thing that you can go to parties and be cool with. Like, hey man, we got Charlie and Bruce. You just Jack. crushed a lot of young <laughs> people's hearts. Just the way it goes. Cause I cause I was making records that I thought were gonna like, well, if they signed to the Dixie Chicks label, man, we looks like heirs to Austin with we could Yeah, time. same deal. We could probably kill it. And then the I go, Oh, they just want to talk about my records. I was wondering why they didn't really care what my record sounded like. Cause nobody would ever say, like, hey, we don't hear a single. They would just put the records out. And I was like, Oh, y'all don't really care if these are successful. So you wouldn't cut 30 songs and then you would have, what's his name over at the Big Machine? Um, Scott Braschetta. Oh, that's way later. Yeah, I know. But that's totally different between. A cut way <laughs> different. Way different deal. Do the difference between Black Mangrum and Scott Borchetta is very different. <laughs> <laughs> like Scott Borchetta goes, who the fuck is this Black Mangrum dude? Get him the fuck out. We ain't talking to him. But then he produced the number one hit for you. Of course, man. He, like every decision that I get to make now about my career is because of Scott and really? because of Black Mangrum. But like, it's a different deal. Like when I was on Lucky Dog, it was like, go be an artist. Go, just go do whatever you're going to do. Cause they didn't care. Well, no, they did. Come on. No, 
dude. They dude. just signed you because you, Bruce, and Charlie were the cool kids down in Texas. We need some cool, vibey artists on this Lucky Dog label. And if we, and if we, if we, it was kind uh, of like MCA Rising Tide, same deal, same kind of deal. Only Rising Tide had a little more lofty goals, but but with with, with Sony Lucky Dog, it was more like if they go out and sell the. 50,000 records we think they might probably anyway will break even or we'll lose a little money but it'll up our cred we can make great records and it'll just be a part of our catalog that over the next 20 years there'll be artists that last like I don't think they just wrote me off I just think they thought that we would be what, what John they had Prine their or, they had their money train and they're like maybe they'll do something yeah, and if, crazy and if we lose and, money it's a tax write off and if we make money over 20 years and we up their cred then they'll sign more dixie chicks who want to be cool and also can be commercial you don't find that nowadays no because it's, it's not the way the labels work like now it's there's no room for artist development now it's like either you have, have go out and be a heavyweight champion or go home and you were getting your you were already doing your deals, so you were getting your records paid for, right? And so, yeah. And so I wasn't worried about compromising at that time because I was like, I'm making a living, the living I want to make anyway, without you. So I can make my records with you or I can make them without you. Did they have any input on the, on the Hey You record? Did they, no, did they because come they didn't, no, because they, they didn't pay attention to it. They didn't care. Who produced that record? Richard Bennett produced Hey You. So the how how Hey You got produced by Richard Bennett was that so I was on Rising Tide. We made Living or Dying with um Steve Earl and Ray Kennedy, the Twang Trust, which was great. So when it came time to make the next record, I was like, hey man, I love Steve. I love Steve Earl. He's Bad ass, and he gave me everything I needed on that record. But he's a lot. Really? Oh, he's a lot. There's a big personality <laughs> attached to that. I guess so. And it was great, man. And he taught me how to give everything I had to every vocal, to every take. Like I never take a take off. Like, like a lot of people make a record and they'll call them scratch vocals uh -huh. to where you just kind of half ass sang and but every time I was with the band, I was like, if I half-ass sing, they're going to half-ass play. And Steve taught me, like, yes, man, you give it. Like, bleed. And I remember he, I was, there was this thing, there was this photo shoot where they wanted me to go do a photo shoot for like a Nashville magazine <laughs> to where they wanted me to sit with this good-looking girl who was a model. And it was a travel magazine and they wanted me to like play footsie with her under the table. And my <laughs> wife was at the sh photo shoot. I was like, this don't feel right. And sure enough, she didn't think it was right. And it was a fiasco. And I was young. Yeah. This was like your first photo shoot. Not my first, but, but definitely yeah. close. And yeah. I was like, what? <laughs> you just go with the flow, right? Don't you just go with the flow? <laughs> and then he called me and he goes, hey, Elvis, come here. He always called me Elvis. <laughs> he really? still does. As we did that outlaw cruise a couple years really? ago. He goes, What's up, Elvis? Go Elvis. <laughs> so he goes, Elvis, come here. And he took me in the studio. He goes, Hey, look, you do everything the studio asks you to do. You do everything the label asks you to do. Unless you think it's going to fuck with your personal life, you fucking do it. And you do it with a smile. You do it with a frown. You do it however the fuck you, they want you to. Unless it's going to fuck with your real life. And then you don't do it. And you do not, you don't worry about it. That's the deal. You give everything to this thing until it's something you can't give. And then you don't give it. And if I learned anything from that session, I was like, got it. Which is why there's such a big separation between my personal life. Like, I'll give everything to this. You know that about me. Like, I'll go all the way. I'll die on stage. But man, don't fuck with my family. Like, don't, yeah. like, like, that's a different deal. And so I learned that from him. But when it came time to, to make the second record, I was like, I'm not sure I can 
go through that you again. You were going to do another record with him. I was. I had to go into his office and be like, hey, man, I think I've learned everything I need to learn from you. And I hate that, but. I never it, do that. It was weird. It I'm sucked. To go and he's never, I've never, like, it's one of those deals where you have a conversation, it's honest, and I knew he knew what I was saying, because he knows who he is. But I, even now when I see him, I still sometimes want to go, hey, man, we're cool, right? <laughs> 25 years later. But I, who knows what he, I don't know if he's cool or not, but I, I still love him. But anyway, from that, I had all those songs for Hey You already. Not all of them, but most of them. Oh. And then, we started making the record with Emery Gordy Jr., who was producing Patty Loveless, who's married to Patty Loveless. He played in the hot band with Amy Lou Harris. Like he's a bass player extraordinaire and a producer extraordinaire. And then Ray was engineering it. And halfway through making that record, well, quarter of the way through making that record, the label they quit Universal MCA stopped funding Rising Tide. So I think I was recording Biloxi <clears throat> and Emory Gordy got on the headphones and goes, Hey man, we need to have a talk. And it was like 18 degrees outside and we were about a block and a half from rising tide records. And he goes, we need to take a walk. So I was like, my first thought was like, <laughs> what did I do? <laughs> did I do something wrong? <laughs> and uh, we walked outside and he goes, Hey, I need to tell you something. And on the way over to the label, he goes, the money's gone. We've already booked your flights. You're going home. And I thought I was making my second major label record. Like, I thought this was the next step. And when I walked into the office, it was one of those deals where you walk into a building or you walk into a room and everybody looks at you like you just farted in church. <laughs> where I was like, what'd I do? <laughs> what the fuck? Because you were only 25 at the time. 28. 28. And, uh, and I walked into Ken's office and he goes, hey, man, it's over. They gave me a five-year deal. It's only been 18 months, but we're done. Yeah. Levitan goes, we're done. Money's gone. It's over. They had Dolly on the label. They had Delbert McClinton on the label. They had a band that had a hit called Buffalo Club. <laughs> they had me and they had some other clown. But, um, <laughs> but it was over. Get your shit. Go home. Who released what record company released Electric? Hey, you. That was Electric. that was that was Lucky Dog. So after the Rising Tide went away, everybody on the label got offered to Universal Decca. Oh wow. Decca Records that had Leanne Womack and Chris Knight. And, uh -huh. So everybody that was on that label got offered to them as a first right of refusal. As like we're we're dissolving this label. There's all these acts. Y'all can take them if you want because it's all under the same contract. Mm -hmm. And uh, nobody picked me up. They picked up D Dolly and they picked up Delbert. Those were only two. That's a whole other story where about five <laughs> years later, I ran into this dude who turned me down and I knew he turned me down. He goes, I've always wanted to work with you. I was like, fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> no, you didn't. You had a chance. But anyway, so about a year later, I got signed to Lucky Dog. And that's where I made Hey You with Richard Bennett. So it was actually a natural progression where we well, worked with Steve, who made Guitar Town and Exit Zero. Now we're at another point in your career, but, and you're still kind of in that vein, like obviously still are into that kind of music, even though he wasn't my biggest influence, but he was a, it was, I was in that world. So they got Richard Bennett, who was producing records and playing with Dire Straits at the time. Oh, wow. And uh, they said, hey, he's the guy who played all those good, dong, 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 like all those guitar lines. Mike, Michael McAdams was playing the Steve Roll at the time. So Mike McAdam played on those records. He didn't play, he played on those tours, but he didn't play on those records. And Mike was in my band at the time. So it just made sense. And Richard Bennett wanted to use all of my band, which was the first time where somebody goes, we want, I want to use your band, the guys that you play with on the road, which was perfect for me. Cause at that time in my career, I was like, I was a road warrior and I wanted to play with my guys. Cause if you make a record without your guys, 
Then when you go out on the road and it gets tough, your guys are like, well, fuck you. <laughs> yeah, right. We're not good enough for your record, but we're good enough for this bullshit Motel 6. <laughs> so it was perfect. And he had the patience to know what being in a band was like because he's been in bands. Mm -hmm. And so we made that record. And then, and then when it came time to make Electric, I was like, well, I got this buddy named Frank Liddell who made Chris Knight's record that I love and that everybody kind of puts me in that world too. I was like, I bet he'll understand what I'm doing. Cause I knew he loved the kind of songs I love. Cause he loved Jim Lauderdale and buddy Miller and all mm -hmm. that stuff that I was into. And he was my camp counselor as when I was eight years old at camp Longhorn. And so there was that weird connection there. And I was like, well, let's see what he has to say. And so we went and made electric where once I talked to him about music, he goes, well, I like people that are crazy. <laughs> yeah. I was like, me Bingo. too. <laughs> me You're too. You're the guy. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was like, well, who do you like? like how'd you do that with Chris Knight? He goes, well, I just got a bunch of people that I thought were really talented and had no idea how they would fit together, but let's just see how it works. I was like, that sounds like something I'm into. And so he did the same thing. at Chris Feinstein who played bass with Jay Joyce's band, Iodine. They got Jay Joyce, who went on to become Jay Joyce, who produced Eric Church and a little big town and a bunch of really great records and Cage the Elephant and a bunch of rock bands. And I remember talking to Mike McCarthy, who was the engineer, and I go, I'm not sure about Jay Joyce. And, and Mike goes, you know what records I've made? And I go, yeah. He goes, well, if you say no to Jay Joyce, then I will not work with you. That's all I knew here. So we got this band of heathens together. Not to be confused with the band of heathens, but like we got this band of like, you know, the misfit kids. And at that time in my life, I was like, well, I've already tried to kind of play the game. What I thought was playing the game, which was not. <laughs> but I was like, I've already tried to kind of fit in. What if I just, I was 30. I was at that time in my life where I was like, I'm 30, man. <laughs> you have to believe me. Yeah. So I was like, let's just do, I'll tell you when it doesn't feel right. Let's just put the throttle down and go as fast as we can in this direction of like rock and roll. Rolling Stones meets Willie Nelson. Let's see what happens. And Frank would always come in after each take and he'd be like, are you cool? I'd be like, yeah, further, go. <laughs> and he would always laugh at me like, you're crazy. I was like, no, I'm not. It's going to be great. So that's how that record happened. What followed Electric? Extra Volts. <laughs> well, there's, well. So that's, Extra that's Volts was, <laughs> Electric came out with like 10 or 12 songs. Extra Volts came about because the Wolf in Dallas started playing a little bit. I was like, well, they're playing this song that's not even on the record. Let's put on an EP that kind of supports it. So we did that. And then after that. I thought you said the extra volts was because you got dropped or that it wasn't commercial or something. And that so you went and made, isn't, that, isn't Happy Happy on there? No, Happy Happy's on live. Oh, shit. So extra volts happened because there were six extra songs on the electric sessions that weren't on the record. <laughs> including a little bit. And they started playing that on the radio in heavy rotation in Dallas, which automatically puts it into like number 35 on the chart or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I want to have something to support it. So we did that. Nothing really happened. But by, get, by proving that you could get into the top 40, it, that's the funny part about this whole thing is like once you prove you can get to a space where nobody thinks you can get to, no matter how you got there, only one station played it. But if you're in the top 40, that's way further than a lot of other artists get with the full support of a big label. So we're like, well, he can get top 40 on his own. Let's see what we do. That's how it kind of got to, into got to Borchetta. That he George was, Corey was, played a part in that deal, huh? Oh, yeah. A big deal. Because in that same time frame, I was like, what else can I do? I'm with this. Levitan, Vector Management. 
who seem to know exactly what to do with artists that have already made it. But they didn't really seem, in my mind, I was like, yeah, they do great with Joe Ely and Lyle Lovett and Patty Griffin and John Hyatt and all these badass artists that I would love to have a career like. However, they didn't really seem to be able to take somebody from the underground to the above ground, which is what I needed at the time. And I remember Kathy Whitley, my friend, who was my manager, dated a manager at the time for eight years. She just kind of looked at me one day and she goes, hey, you need to figure out if you're going to be cool, if you're going to be successful. <laughs> Can I do both? <laughs> I thought I could. And at the time I was like. she Was, was she your first manager? Yeah. Your, yep. And she was badass. But she just goes, hey, man. I, I think there was a miscommunication in that. I wasn't confident in my own talent at that time in my life at 30, 32. Like, I didn't realize I was good enough to become later on what I had to wait for. Lyle, John Hyatt, John Prine, all, all of the guys that are, really are my heroes. I thought that I had to be successful first in some kind of strange way. Like I, I wasn't sure that my songwriting talent or my, or my under, whatever my artistry was, I was like, I think I need to go. I think I have to have hits first to prove I'm, to prove I belong here. And then I can be the kind of artist I want to be, which in the end, that's what's going to happen if it works out. Right. You know what I mean? Like, so, I, so when she said that, I go, all right, I know what I need to do. I need to get a manager who knows exactly what I want. I need to go have some hits. I need to go do this thing. I need to go make, make it happen. The same way Rodney Crowell did, or the same way Rodney Foster did. The same way Ricky Skaggs did. Like the same way some of my heroes, where they went and made it in a way that you can tell your mom at Christmas. What do you tell your mom at Thanksgiving? Yeah. I showed up at Thanksgiving and nobody asked me again if I was going to do music for a living. I'm like, are you sure you're doing that thing still? I was like, have you listened to the fucking radio? <laughs> and once that got out of my system, I go, all right, I'm done with that. <laughs> Can I get back to doing what I'm supposed to be doing? Like, were you, wasn't it like Taylor Swift at one point opening, like playing before you on that tour? Like in 2007, 2008? Or weren't you? Yeah, you know, 2000. Like, like co openers for Brad Paisley. Pace. But I remember there was a there was a showcase at the Whiskey A Go Go, oh wow, where they had where the, they had uh, hay stacks on the stage, and and I showed up at eight thirty and Taylor went on at eight. Come on, hay stacks on the stage at Whiskey A Go Go. Oh yeah, they had like a whole thing. It was set up by the radio station. And Scott Borchetta, bless his heart, like he, like it was filled, and we went to go eat at wherever he used to go eat with Motley Crue, and like. It was the whole deal. Like, hey, man, I used to come here with these guys. And, and then uh, I showed up, went upstairs, Taylor's on. And I went on after her. And it was killer night. And like, to this day, man, like, I look at my kids. I'm like, you know, she used to open for me, man. Aren't you in the liner no notes of her first album? Yeah, because when we were on the road, I used, we used to go do meet and greets together at radio stations and whatever. And I would be like, hey, Taylor, I think you're a little different than everybody else. <laughs> I guess so. And I remember telling her, like, do yourself a favor and write all this down so you remember when you were 16, 17, 18, 19. Because when you turn 40, this is going to be badass to think about. And, and I remember she, in her liner notes, she said, uh, Thanks to Jack Ingram, if I can ever be as cool as you, I'll be half as cool as I need to be, or whatever. And her liner notes and her record. <clears throat> yeah, like I was friends diary. with her. I used to take her to get coffee. And like I, I used to make fun of her at meet and greets. Rode in the van with her. Yeah. Like we'd go to meet and greets together and go to radio stations together. And I'd be like, hey, Taylor, you don't have to kiss all their ass. <laughs> Just half of each one of them. And she's like, that's how it works, Jack. So a year ago, Brichetta. 
and Taylor Swift got in a big rift. Were you surprised at any of that? No, man. Like, as soon as you... Look, that's the beauty of Scott Borchetta. Like, he's a badass. Don't, make no mistake. I, like, I, he's I, a prize I, fighter. I mean, I'm, I'm reading this stuff. I'm going, if it wasn't for this dude, this girl wouldn't be where she's at today. Yeah, she would. Okay. Go ahead. I have a picture of that diary deal, by the way. <laughs> yeah, Isn't she that would. that cool? Diary? Of Taylor Swift's diary. Oh, it's a diary entry. Like, she wrote a diary entry. So Jack, Jack Ingram talked to me a few days ago at a show we did in Wisconsin for, I can't read it, but anyway. August 7th. Everything that happens from here on out will be dedicated to Jack Ingram. And you get 10, I get, I'll get he's 10%. Get, he's, get, he's under publishing. <laughs> I'll get 10% <laughs> on the publishing deal. Wow. So what was he like? Doing? I care about her. Like she's been the other page is lyrics of a song that Blue Sanders wrote called "Hold On" that he cut. I didn't know Blue Sanders wrote that song. Yeah, and she sang it at a show. That's when you realize that that an endorsement from another artist doesn't mean jack shit necessarily. Because <laughs> like she sang that at a couple of her shows, and there weren't. It's a trip. How that works? Is he an asshole, or is he just knows what he can do? Scott. Yeah, both. Like what I've figured out is that there, there's nobody in this world, at least from my experience, there's nobody who gets to who who succeeds at that level, at any level really, that doesn't piss somebody off, because and it's not a matter of stepping on toes and and being inconsiderate. It's a matter of knowing exactly what you want. That's your agenda. I used to work for a guy like that. Yeah. Yeah, you did. Fucking knew what he wanted. So Scott Borchetta is exactly, in my mind, the equivalent, give or take, different character qualities of Vince McMahon. It's like, yeah, man, when somebody has an opinion that's unmovable. He's like the villain. Or the hero. Doesn't depending matter. What artist depending is. on who you are. Yeah, depending on who he's backing <laughs> at the time. And so, I, you know, it's like one of those things where, he told me one time, he goes, you're the driver. He's a NASCAR guy. He goes, you're the driver. Quit trying to be the pit crew chief, the thing, the thing, the owner. He goes, dude, drive the car. I'll take care of the rest. And I wasn't comfortable in that role after a certain level. I was like, no, man, I want to choose the tires. I want to choose the thing. I want to... And he goes, that ain't how it works. And I go, all right, well, fuck you. And he goes, well, no. Fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> hey, guess what? I win. And you do We too. both win. And you do too. Yeah, I get to be here now doing what I want to do. And I, I don't have to be trying to be somebody that I'm not. So he understood about, that. Talking about the here and now. You want to, you're, you're right now? Are you leaving? No, it's like, thank you. Huh? No, you're not. I, I know you're getting, just getting late. Um, anyways. Later, buddy. Appreciate you letting me invade your. Hey, podcast. It was, it was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Y'all be careful. Later, buddy. Thank you for everything. Yeah, it was good to see you. Take care. Hey, Tony. You want some? Does this seem superfluous or does it seem like it's good material? No, no. I, this is the, the whole. Like, uh, we're not wasting our time? No, 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 no. Podcasts, long form conversations. This is what you can't get out of. But it is funny when you kind of get to that point where you're like, are we just talking? Yeah. Yes. And that's that's what people want. Right. They want they want to hear your story. Well, look, this is take two. Because the first take I was got a little bit I don't drink a lot. It's a good thing. It doesn't matter, man. You I just need to smoke. It's not like you're fine. Cocaine or something like that. Well, you don't really smoke cocaine. Yeah, you can. It's called crack. <laughs> right. <laughs> Like I said, <laughs> this better be good. Uh, you really walked in. Really Put your pants back on. We got him down. Sure hope you find that what hat. What are you looking for? Uh, that, that fluorescent green hat is perfect. I don't remember. Well, trust me, you didn't need it anyway. (laughs) (laughs) I'm kidding. He did. He had it. He had it. All right. So what? um, Make sure I look good. (laughs)
By the way, that shot he was taking out there with the flag. Looked cool. Looked great. Was it hot? Like sexy? Hot heat. When it's hot, it's funny, man. That's how I know I feel comfortable. Like it was hot, but I wasn't sweating. Like I sweat when I'm like, I got to make this shit work. <laughs> what were you going to ask? You were drunk last time. You're really drunk last time. I got kind of Okay. Drunk. I've had a rough month. But. Oh, that again? What no. a baby. <laughs> no, I'm fine. Sometimes you get knocked down. <laughs> Everyone has their house fire every now and again. <laughs> has their house fire, Tori. Dog died. <laughs> Basically, what happened last time, we may have talked about this already, but there was a lot of good shit that I think you're under the assumption that you need to rush through or that people don't really see a long form deal. And so I feel like we covered a lot of topics that could be used later on and talked about more in depth versus like blah, 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 subject. And then we spend two minutes on it and then we get sidetracked either because somebody says something. Okay. So like, go. did you like the intro? Did you like him introing or did you like, would you like it just like, Hey, this is jacking around. And then we're bullshitting about, why we started this versus like, hey guys, this is Matt Pivato. This is Kevin Howard. Do you like that or do you? You tell me. You're, you're the you're the you're the man. Uh, it's Johnny Carson or anybody else where you go. Hey, acknowledge you. Yeah, you're here. I'm with That's Jerry Seinfeld and in uh, cars getting coffee. Comedians in cars getting coffee. Oh yeah, I always look for that one. Camera. But so yeah, it's like hey man. This is jacking around. I'm Jack. We're jacking around with Matt Pivato, with whoever. Yep. Yeah. Waylon Payne, so and so and so and so. And uh, we're only here because he's my good friend. We're good friends. You trust me. Now I'm going to pretend like you're not there. That's right. And here we go. Why? That's why Steve Earl calls you Elvis. Well, it, I do know that that's why I, like I do that at shows where I go, yeah. I'm going to acknowledge you, but then when you see me losing myself, I'm lost. And you can trust in that. Next question, what do you mean when you get lost? Like when I, when I go, hey, good to see everybody. Hope y'all are rocking. It won't be having a good time. We're about to go somewhere that we've never been before. And then I cut you off. And then it used to make me weird. It used to weird me out to hear Garth Brooks talk about it. And I'm not comparing myself to him. <laughs> However, when he would be like, there's, there's me and then there's GB or whatever. I'd be like, well, that's weird. But then once I really realized how you lose yourself in a show, like I could be doing anything. And if I'm into it, I, I know you're there. I told now, But you're no longer there, man. Yeah, like, man. I am in this moment with It's the, like Springsteen show. Exactly. Where you just get lost in it. Where I am gone. Yeah. I'll come back to you at some point, maybe. But at the beginning, I was there and I said, hey, how y'all doing? All right, we're here together. Watch this. And then if you go watch this and then you keep, while you're doing whatever you're doing, you go, are y'all with us? <laughs> you break the fourth wall. <laughs> like, it's, it's almost like a theater thing. Like you just can't ever, if you acknowledge the crowd at a level where they think you care, then you, you make them lose, like then they're no longer lost in the moment. Gotcha. But if you really make them believe that you're about to lose your shit or the, or the band's about to fall apart or you're about to fall apart, that's why people always go, Jack's fucked up. Jack's crazy. I, Jack I, If I gave you a dollar. How many times I've heard that in my life. But it's funny because I always go like, I thought that was the point. If I'm aware of you, then how is this authentic? I can't yeah. pretend to be a farmer unless I'm farming. <laughs> I get, you know I, what I mean? It's like, it's like, why can't you let me do what the whole, like the whole reason I got into this is because I knew Jerry Jeff Walker didn't give a fuck what I thought about him. That's the only reason I loved him. Willie's the same way. Waylon, 
George Jones. Like, okay, some people have to get, like George had to get, get drunk. Like some people have to use that, and that's fine. Whatever you have to do to get to a point where you don't give a shit what anybody else thinks, that's what I'm into. I'm fully committed. There, there's a lot of artists out there I've looked up at and said, wow, that dude's so fucked up. I'm, I, I can't tolerate that. I gotta, I'm leaving early. Never. The only time I ever felt like that, or the only time I ever was like that, I knew it. And I go, I remember one time at Billy Bob's, I got an encore. This is early on. And I went out to play um, Elmo Lincoln, the song you always want to hear. And by the way, Elmo Lincoln is also the name. I didn't know this when I wrote the song. This is the best part about this. This, this is what makes me kind of believe in this other afterlife thing. Elmo Lincoln is the name of the song I wrote about David Lincoln Walter. Elmo Lincoln is the, name, the real name of the first guy that ever played Tarzan in the movies. And David Lichten Walter was like Tarzan. It was crazy. So anyway, that's the part early on in my career where I go, something's up. That's weird because I've never heard of Elmo Lincoln. I just came up with that name out of nowhere. I thought I was just making it up. So anyway, that being said, I was at Billy Bob's one time. It was the first time I had like a really big audience. And I got an encore and I came out and I was trying to play that song acoustic. And I had taken a shot from somebody. Robert Gallagher, probably. No, like a crowd member. And they put it on the monitors. You know, those monitors at Billy Bob's are flat, so you can put drinks on them. Mm -hmm. So they put a, a shot up there. I took it. It was <laughs> early in my career, so I didn't realize that if you took that first shot, that means you're going to get 15 more. Because everybody always goes, Oh, they'll take a shot if I take it up there. Yeah, I've never thought about that before. So all of a sudden, there's like five of them. And I was like, well, I don't, I'm, I want to be like Jerry Jeff or Willie. Like, I want to be like my <laughs> thunk, thunk, thunk. And I'm taking shot after shot after shot. By the time the encore comes, I'm like, ah, fuck it, okay. <laughs> I go out there and try and play Elmo Lincoln, which is obviously a six minute song in the first place. <laughs> I never got through it, and it took me 20 minutes. <laughs> like, I couldn't remember the words. I was like, this is mortifying. <laughs> like, I don't ever want to feel like this again. So to your point, I've always wanted to be fucked up during my shows, <laughs> meaning being lost in the same thing that, that this is what I made mention of Garth Brooks earlier, because I thought it was silly and goofy when he said it the first time because he mentioned shows with sex and i mentioned remember, what he he mentioned that being on stage as garth brooks as gb as gb that's his alter ego i thought chris gaines was alter ego. That was that's an alter alter ego <laughs> 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 i remember watching an interview before chris gaines got it where he said garth brooks is me GB is. Oh, that uh, I get it. This other dude. And I remember going, ah, that's silly. <laughs> and he and he compared it to having sex and how like how it's like that, how when you're in it and you're in that moment, you just lose yourself. And I remember thinking that was so silly until at some point in my career, I go, what can I compare this to? And I'm like, well, the only thing I can compare it to is like being completely giving yourself to a basketball game, to a football game, to a girl, to what, like to where you have no inhibitions and there's no alcohol needed. There's no drugs needed. There's no nothing. You completely give yourself up to this other passion. What's the best show you've ever had? When I get to Green Hall, it's when I get, it's when Billy Bob's is happening. There's definitely a different energy with, with places like Billy Bob's when it's happening in Green Hall. Green Hall's happening every time that he plays there. And I can definitely tell there's a different high coming from him when he gets off stage. But also, solo acoustic, the Kessler. He did a show last December, the Kessler. We got off stage, walked up on the bus. I looked at him, I was like, dude. And he was like, was that as fucking good as I thought it was? And I was like, it was pretty fucking badass. And I've seen a thousand of his shows. 
And I even was like in the middle of that show going, holy shit. And I didn't want it to end. Like I remember that we were at a 90 minute mark and I was like, holy shit, I feel like the show just started. And I, I've seriously, I see a hundred a year. And then when we got on the bus, it was like eye contact of like, was that as good as I thought it was? Like it was badass. That show you've seen them. Green Hall. But there's not one show that like, God, I remember that time I was opening up for whoever in Seattle. I can tell you one thing for sure. It's never when you were opening up for anybody. Really? Doesn't matter who, what arena. That can be stadium. You're if you open up for somebody and you're in front of 100,000 people, if you're opening up the show. Like, like, like it the can, right before the headliner, Kenny Chess. It can be badass. Rolling Stones, it doesn't matter. It can be badass, but it's never going to be as great as it could be in front of five people that paid to see you play. Because you're getting, he's having to <laughs> condense something that he's done for 90 minutes, 100. And everybody times. there, like no matter, when you're a headliner, if it's five people, all five people live their entire last 24 hours dedicated to getting to see you play. Mm -hmm. And if I deliver that to them, then they are, then they might as well be seeing the Rolling Stones in front of 100,000 people. It's, it's no different for me, and it's no different for them. That's the beauty of music is that if I show up and I'm only there for one reason, and they show up and they're only there for one reason, 10 or 10,000. It doesn't fucking matter. But if I show up and I'm watching people get to their seat and spill their beer and get mad at their husband, I see them. Like I'd spent five years looking at people getting to their seats yeah, where they weren't digging it. And they're like, Oh, that's that guy that sings that song. It's a very fucking different experience than all I am here for is him. That's where the sex part comes in. <laughs> <laughs> See what I, I mean? will say though, there's times where like in Australia, when we go over there and do those shows, those people don't get live music like we do. So they fucking, they realized that he was going to be there. You could tell they fucking did their homework. They from, he could, yeah, he could that's play cool. something off Hey You. He could play something off mainstream. Because they don't know what hits are. They don't. So they just love and it so there's 15,000 people there. And they, every song they like is a hit. They did research on every artist that was going to be there. There's 15,000 people there. And they literally sang every fucking deep cut hit of his. And I was like, this is pretty badass. Did a European tour. And you probably has probably been 10 years since you've been it was, in Europe. I did it in 1997. <coughs> so I've done two deep. Like three weeks. European weeks. tours. I've done, I've done one deep European tour, which was Scotland, Ireland, the whole bit. And I've done four trips to Australia, one deep tour. And once you go deep, you still need that, that extra thing. You still need like some kind of extra push, some kind of extra hit, some kind of extra oh, something. Okay. But if you go to the big cities or, or whatever, it all works out because the press is right and, and you're the next big thing or whatever. But like the deep, the deep Australian tour was a lot of fun. But unless you draw a thousand people, it's not successful. So we were drawing two or three hundred people. Those guys, did they get acts over there very much? I think in Australia, does they have their? They, well, I think it's just a different did deal. Australian music scene. I think yeah, it's kind of like they had a. They, there's a scene. Yeah, and they have their own scene, kind of like Canada has their own scene. Like, I don't know if they have uh, Australian content rules, but like Canadian content, like there's a government rule. You'll love this. <laughs> is that there's a CanCon, they call it CanCon, in that on the radio, FM radio, you have to play, I don't know what it is, 60%, 40%, some kind of percentage, which is pretty substantial, of Canadian content. Really? So, you, so, if, you, so, if, so if you're a top 40 station, you can play Tim McGraw, Garth Brooks, Taylor Swift, blah, 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 four or six songs, but... The other four songs have to be made in Canada. The same way that, that, that uh, you can go to Canada and make movies and you get some incredible tax write-off if you use 40% Canadian actors. Have you ever seen Strange Brew? Of course. 
I mean, that's brilliant because <laughs> it's not like I'm saying there's not great Canadian talent. It's a talent. great movie. Of course. <laughs> and Neil Young's a badass too. <laughs> so is Alanis Morissette. Have you ever but, seen Strange Brew? No. Fast Times at Richmond High? I have. There you go. That's not Canadian content. No, it's not, but it's close enough. But Strange Brew is a good movie. We should watch it. We, we should quit this bullshit and watch that movie. <laughs> Great. Here, take another hit and forget the rest. Yeah. <laughs> forget the rest. Anyway. They did have it. When we were there the last time in Australia, they did have their their hot country guide. It was basically a complete ripoff of Keith Urban, but. I remember they also had a George Strait ripoff. Yeah. they had, So they had their Keith Urban guy that stays full time in Australia, and then Keith Urban goes over there a lot. But, you can't tour, but I mean, they fucking can't... loved him. I mean, there was fucking, there was 15,000 people there. I think that yeah, absolutely. Seen, no, I saw the uh, it's on YouTube, the uh, your show from Australia. It's yeah, like, it was like you're watching an amphitheater, like fifteen thousand. That people. was the I told Jack the story recently, but that going over there, they lost our pedal board, his pedal board, and the lead guitar pedal board, which is Brad Rice at the time. And I only took two tuners to guitar tech and for his acoustic show that we were doing. And so when they lost the pedal boards, I had to give my tuner to Brad, and I had to give my other tuner to Jack, so I didn't have anything to guitar tech with. So Jack broke a string, and so I restring it, but I had to go out on stage and plug in while he was running around entertaining, oh. and I had to tune, and my head's down, and I get that string right. I look up, and they had the the lights on where you could see the crowd, and my legs started shaking. <laughs> and I looked at Jack, I was like, how the fuck do you do this? <laughs> so progressing to – and I, asked, I don't think I've ever asked this question, black and white. Why did it take eight years to release a record? Between Big Dreams and High Hopes? Yeah. And a, and Midnight Motel? Yeah. Because cause I'm a fan of music. And I know that, that if I don't trust somebody as an artist or as a person or mm -hmm. whatever, that I won't believe what they have to say as a musician because like everything that you just say as a musician, as a songwriter is an extension of who you are. And I thought, I remember watching some country guys when I was, when I was in that world in the mainstream country world, I remember seeing some of them come with, with records that they were like, Oh, that was me then. This is me now. Mm -hmm. Believe me now. It's like, well, we believed you then. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember just thinking like, I know who I am, but I also know like, you can't go from, <laughs> this might sound strange, but like, you can't go from being a student council president to being I don't give a shit about that. Even though you might have been misled by the student council thing in high school, <laughs> and you might go, wait, I see the light. And you, like, you can't just all of a sudden go to the guys in the parking lot and be like, no, I'm a smoker now. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's just not going to work, man. And so I just remember going, I know how I feel, and I know where I came from. And I got into this, I got into the mainstream world because, because I was convinced that Guy Clark and Jerry Jeff, even Rodney Crowell, all of my heroes that, that were badass songwriters and artists, I was convinced they just quit trying. They just didn't, they just didn't keep pushing past that last moment of resistance where they could break through. Because I thought there was no difference between why Garth Brooks would have the kind of success he has, which is fantastic, but why couldn't Guy Clark have the same? So you felt that Guy Clark, for example, they just didn't, they didn't, they didn't come through the finish line it's very hard. Pushing. They just didn't push through it. No. So you almost blame the artist a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. For that. Absolutely, man. I was like, like, I would blame it on whatever the, or not just not being willing to really be vulnerable enough 
to not saying I tried. Because a lot of artists in my world rely on, I'll pretend like I'm not trying and that will make me look cool. <laughs> I can name a few of those. <laughs> and I've always hated that, man. <laughs> I've always been like, bullshit, <laughs> you, you try more than anyone. <laughs> so I was always like, that's bullshit. So I was like, I will not quit trying. <laughs> so I'll just keep. Found the dirt. And so I just hammered through it. And then I realized once you got into it, <coughs> that, that's not the case. COVID, that's no big deal. Don't worry about it. I'm fine. I, I, can, I can't taste, can't yeah. taste anything. No, this smell, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that smells bad. And everything. <laughs> I just thought they weren't trying, man. Or I thought they gave up. And so that was the whole reason why I was like, I will not give up. I will keep going until even if I die. But then once I've achieved a number one, a number one record, no, top 10 hits, best new male vocalist, all that. I was like, when do we get to do the bait and switch? <laughs> when do I get to go, okay, I don't longer have to try like that. I can try like this. I can just be my best and kill it. And then I realized like, oh, you can't get into this by effort or deeds. Like, man, Kenny Chesney believes in Kenny Chesney. Like he does. And whatever, it, whatever I believe in makes no makes no difference. Garth Brooks believes in Garth Brooks. Kenny Chesney, like they they know what they're doing is exactly who they're supposed to be. And I I was thinking that I'll get in because I love Garth Brooks. I love Kenny Chesney, but I'm a little different than them. And I was like, I'll get in and go, hey man, here's my slot. And when I found out, I was like, people were like, hey, man, you don't get in here by it. You don't dupe me. Mm -hmm. We could get into a political conversation about this whole deal. It's like, man, they may be simple, but they ain't stupid. <laughs> like, dude, I, I got in and go, the only, the only one who's trying to dupe anybody is me. I'm trying to say, hey, I'll get in on this card but I'll play this card. And that's just saying how it works, man. Like I'm a songwriter. But what? eight years also was like a label fell through in there in that time. So like if there was a date set, like there was, I think there was a point where he was going to take a break. There was no doubt about it, but whether it was no, what happened? Hold eight on. Years. So you're asking why eight, yeah, I mean, why eight yeah, years? Yeah, I'm yeah. sorry. I got, I got off track. So hold on. Eight years. Why eight years? Because the first three years I go, okay, I don't, I no longer have a label because Scott at Big Machine said, Hey man, we've tried eight singles. Like, I think that's his number. Like, I think he has a formula. If you go eight singles and you're not over a million records yet, it ain't gonna happen, which was actually probably pretty true. Like that's where my theory of like, Hey man, whatever I was selling, they weren't buying. So then I go, okay, cool. I'll go make a record of eight or 10 songs that I think I would buy. The main takeaway from, from the whole big machine thing is that don't try to sell what you would not buy. Don't try to sell what you would not buy because that will never work. And so when I left that label, I go, okay, I will no longer make records that have any compromise in them, even though sometimes that works, but compromise won't work for me. So I went and made six or eight songs that I was like, if I was in charge of the world, this is what country music would sound like. And I took them to every label. And I had access at that point to all the big labels. And I go, hey, man, this, this is what I think we could work with. And I think this would work. And there was this kind of vibe of like, this is where the, the Scott Borchetta thing is a double-edged sword. If he couldn't make it work, what makes you think we could? Because he's the best. Interesting. Like even the best of the other best that I thought were badass, they kind of looked at me like, you were with the best, bro. Yeah. <laughs> like, what, what, like I, what do you think I'm going to do with your sorry ass? You're almost 40 years old. And so I was like, oh. So after that, 
which is only a couple years, I go, I got to go home. If I'm going to really do what I need to do, it's about, it's about writing songs. It's about really making records. And, and seriously, though, like, he's not doing the – where. so when he's having those hits, he's having to fund a radio tour out of his own pocket to make this a hit. Or maybe you're getting compensated, I don't know. But arguably, we can't – he brought it back to home, and then the expenses went down a lot, and then he's still doing over 100 dates a year. So financially, it wasn't really, like, a burden on him to not – I mean, right, it's he would have to answer that. But a half million dollars off your payroll – or whatever you want to say the number is, and then mm. just cutting your payroll. So bunch what does that... I make this. Go with me. I love it. Go with me. What, is, what does this mean to you in your career? So especially? that's the ACM for Song of the Year for 10, Ten Man. Man. So in 2008, I won Best New Male Vocalist mm. of the Year, which was fantastic. It was great. It, it still is great. And it's an award for an artist, for, a, for an act, which is kind of by definition a label thing. Like they call their friends and they go, hey, you vote for this guy, I'll vote for that guy, you vote for this girl, I'll vote for that girl. And so you win it based on a, uh, some kind of race some kind of race to the top, to the finish line of who's going to be the mm-hmm. next entertainer of the year. And, but the, the one thing about getting nominated for song of the year, which is a songwriter award is that's not based on nobody's in that race, man. Mm-hmm. It's like, you want to be great, but you don't get to determine or influence who tells you you're great. You can, You can kind of influence who tells you you're successful or who tells you you're going to be great or you're going to be, but as far as songwriting goes, man, that's a sacred space in country music. Like you either write a great song or you don't. And the best part is that when you write a great song, sometimes nobody ever hears it, Mm -hmm. but your friends that you ever play it for go, Oh, holy shit. Wow. I wish I could write that. And when that thing happens where you write it with an artist like Miranda Lambert and she puts it out and then everybody else in the industry who writes great songs every day. John Randall. John Randall, Miranda Lambert. We all have friends that write fantastic songs every day that make us cry, make us feel the chills. And, and when that gets recognized as the song of the year, that's kind of one of those things where I don't care if anybody ever knows I won that. Like, it doesn't matter if it's an award that's on a mantle, which it is. It just matters that I, I know I never have to second guess. All those doubts I had as an artist about, does this make any sense unless I become Garth Brooks? Because that's what that was gauged against. Now it's like, I don't ever have to. Validation. Val- yeah, I don't, I don't ever need validation again. I, that that, that uh, itch got scratched, and now I'm like, hey, man, I write songs, and if you hear them and like them, great, and if you don't. My point is, eight years later, you get this, and the great nominee. Than that. You know, from the, from the record, from the. Yeah, it was a long time to make a bet on myself. Yeah. But in that, I mean, but in that eight years, though, you off. arguably hit your stride as a songwriter because even the songs that I heard you writing when I first started working for you were great, but you, you started writing with Lori McKenna. You started writing with Liz Rose. Or not started, but you started making it a point to go do, do writing. I think in my mind, I just, like. start, I just started realizing that instead of using – so this is an interesting thing I've never really thought of is that – Instead of, so I have great friends. I've always had great friends that are great songwriters. John Randall, Mm -hmm. Jim Lauderdale, Liz, Rose, Lori McKenna, Blue Sand. Like there's a bunch of people that I have songwriter relationships with that I would, that I would call if I had a good idea Mm -hmm. because I would want them to help me make it better. 
And I think one of the things that happens at, I don't know, just whenever it happened is that now I call them because I think it could be better. Like, I don't feel like I need them to finish it. I just feel like this could, like, I, I see, I see the, complimentary aspect of it i see what it could be if i'm with friends that i love but it's not like i need them to finish it mm -hmm. it's a trip because did you ever subconsciously feel like when you were in big machine when you're writing did you ever feel like you had to have a hit or like you, i'm writing a hit or did you still take it as like I'm no that's a, a that's a bit that, that, that's why i trust in songwriting because even though none of my songs were ever none of my songs that i ever wrote were singles I still always felt like that was their problem. <laughs> like, That's great. That may be delusional, but like I still always like songwriting has never let me down when, I, when it feels like the truth to me, it's just the truth and I can't make it better. Where are you going with your songwriting and your records? Jack Ingram acoustic stuff. Where do you see that going over the next five or 10 years? I mean, do you, do you put a time or you just let it go and you just let it kind of work itself out? I don't know, man. I, I always think of my show as. I mean, do you see another electric record in in out there? Or do you see I definitely a, see more of acoustic records? No, continued acoustic or just whatever. I see really tight records following the songs. Like I do see tight records. Like uh, I, I have had thoughts of one of my favorite records growing up as a high schooler was paper and fire. I think this is the name of the record paper and fire by John Mellencamp. Mm -hmm. Like I, I understand what tight arrangements are and how that can pop in a way that you don't have to beat people over the heads. It's just, it's just tight arrangements with great songs. And if that's the way my records go, I'm cool. But if I can't find what those arrangements are and how that really pops, I do know that over the last 10 years, I've, I've learned how to make my acoustic guitar pop in ways that don't have to be full band arrangements. And so I just want them, I just want my songs to, to, to hit people in the face. Like, I'll never change that. Like, I just want to give you a shows. bloody nose. I see a lot of Todd guy. Snyder. I mean, I've seen even from you back in the early days, 25 years ago. I saw Todd and the Nervous Rex and then saw you. And I'm like, it's a yeah, lot I of think that's why we're great friends because I think he a sees a lot of, of himself in me. And I yep. think I see a lot of myself in him where it's like, whatever it takes, however I can give you a black eye or make you hurt or feel <laughs> joyous yeah. or both at the same time. Like that's that's what those guys did to me, man. That's what every artist that's that it's in my collection does to me they they make me angry and sad and happy and you enjoy doing this there's just something innate about it there's something innate about why guys like me why guys like whaling and why guys like you feel the need to and guys like you like there's a reason why he's drawn to my world yeah. And why I'm why I'm like, hey man, come on in. I think you understand what I'm what I'm trying to do. I think there's something to be said about being interested in like, why do we all feel this way? Why do we all why do we all reach outside of our grasp for something that we know is there? Like, God forbid, and forgive me for saying it, but I like I talked to my brother about this stuff. I talked to people that believe in, in Jesus about this stuff. It's mm -hmm. like, what are we all reaching for that, that I get from music that you get from Jesus, that you get from money, that you get from chicks, that you get from drugs, whatever it is, man, we're all reaching for something. And at the end of the day, we all get what we're looking for in different ways. And I just enjoy the search of that. And I enjoy finding out what Waylon's looking for. I'm like, I want to know, why do you write songs? Because mm -hmm. I write them for this. Some people write them for pussy. 
Like I remember, <laughs> like I yeah. remember reading articles about guys that I thought were deep and deep and deeper and deep, and they go, "Why do you write songs?" Roger Miller goes, "Because I want to get laid." And I'm like, "What? <laughs> I want to write songs to know why I want to get laid." Like it's just this thing where you know that's never been answered, and maybe it never will, but. I feel like every song I write gets a little closer to something where I go, I feel a little more settled. Mm -hmm. And that's why I stay up talking to you about this shit late at night. When we're on the bus, man, that's all we do. Mm -hmm. Even if we're doing dumb shit, like whatever we're doing, it's never about doing that. It's always about, hey, man, play me a song. Mm -hmm. Play me something that makes you freak out. Play me with something that makes you cry, laugh, get chills. If you're not into that, then you're not listening to this podcast. Then you're not in the music business. Because other than that, man, why the fuck? Like, let's just turn on ESPN. It's interesting. It's, you're excited about it. And you've really enjoyed this. And it's interesting to hear some of the people that you've mentioned outside of the music world. One thing I do love is people go, what are you into? And I go, well, like, what do you do outside of music? I go, well, I watch golf. <laughs> Why? It's boring. I go, no, man. It's amazing. Like, you can watch every week the best of the best. Like, you can turn on VH1 or, or any music program. And just because someone's popular does not mean they're the best. Yep. But when you turn on a sports program, you know very quickly that when Tiger Woods is on, <laughs> he's the best. That when Brooks Kepka's on, he's the best. That when LeBron James is on, Steph Curry, they're the best. And you can, you can try as hard as you want, but you can't find anybody it's better. True. And so one of the things that I love about that search is that I never got into this to be popular. I hope to be popular, but like popularity is really fleeting. That just mm -hmm. depends on if you like me and what I'm saying is that you, mm -hmm. that makes you feel better. But when you're the best at a sport that keeps score, which music does not on a, on a best level, it doesn't keep score. It keeps mm -hmm. best. It keeps a level. It keeps score on a level of who has more number ones, who sells more records. Yeah. But the Beatles never won a Grammy. They didn't. didn't. They might have won post posthumous, but like being the best in art is really subjective. Mm -hmm. Which is why I grasp to sports. Which is like what what do these guys do that are the same habits I have? Like, what are they, what are they focused on that are the same habits I have, which is repeating a line over and over and mm -hmm. over and over and over yeah. again <laughs> until I know you can't beat it. Yep. That's what, a, that's what a golfer does. He puts the same putt a thousand times. So he goes, I'll never miss this in competition. <laughs> that's right. And if they do, it's some kind of weird anomaly that has to do with, but like, that's what I get off on. That's why this is exciting to me. Cause I go, Oh, I've never done this where I talk to people. I've just, I've just done this where I talk at people mm -hmm. and I've gotten pretty good at it. True. Yeah. Like I can tell you what I think you should believe and I'll do my best to make you believe it. But it's fun to have somebody talking back at me and going, Oh, Hey man, let's play catch. Yeah. Yeah. Like, let's do this other thing. <laughs> Which is fun, man. And, and and certainly now that I know that people respond to it and they talk back and we can have a, a dialogue that doesn't necessarily make me want to like like I like in my mind, if I do this right, people will dig it at a certain level but I won't change my conversation or my attitude based on what people think of it. Mm -hmm. That's the hardest part about social media. 
is that I'm a people pleaser. And so if I start reading comments about, well, why'd you talk so much about yourself? Or why'd you talk so much about this? Or I'll be like, oh, sorry. The, so just make sure you put the comment section. <laughs> make sure you <laughs> delete it. Well, that's the thing, man. <clears throat> hey, it, people have been telling me for years to watch more for the comment section. I'm like, I, I, I don't want to tell Mick Jagger what I think of him. I just want him to be who he is. So you read a lot of being a big Joe Rogan fan. Like Rogan does not read any of his comments. He just won't. See? Like there's no fucking reason why. All I'm going to do is get pissed off and angry. So just let other people do it and monitor. Well, he it. says that he'll get pissed off and angry. What he really means is he'll change what he does and he doesn't want to do that. Yeah. That's the thing is like you, when somebody puts you down, no matter what you think about how cool you are, you will change what you do. That's why when I started making music, I go, I don't care what you think. It's like, I really do. I just don't want to change what I think is the right direction. It will be interesting to uh, watch this in another year, look back and go, it was a fun year. Hopefully we'll have some big artists. Names. Hey man, let's make oh. sure we do something good with this because if we look back in a year and this goes nowhere, <laughs> that would fucking suck. <laughs> hey, this has been jacking around. We jacked around. See you next time.